in large sense, and many, many people will say, does a pray work? Do I pray I had a result? Uh, certainly, to some extent, this is kind of a looking for miraculous. But I think everybody, a lot of Chinese will have a reasonable. They are not asking for all oh, raising from the dead, you know. Right. They're yeah, reasonable. Right. You know, I have a sickness and I have a visa situation. And does God know? And does he really hear my prayer? And I guess a lot of Chinese will have this kind of empirical, you know, fully persuaded. They will do a reasoning, they will do a lot of a rational thinking, but does the prayer work? Yeah, see, here's, here's the thing, is that I'm just here to tell you that God answers all prayers. Sometimes he answers right. no, <laughs> uh -huh. but he heard it right. and he right. knows it. And for some reason or another, he's decided right. not right. to, okay? And, and this is where we come back again to the Gospel of John, mm -hmm. and there's Thomas, and Jesus presents himself right. to Thomas. And I'm having more and more appreciation for Thomas uh, because my wife reminded me that a few chapters before, you know, Thomas says, well, I'm not going to be persuaded unless I can put my finger where the nail was and my hand where the sword went in his side. And my wife reminds me, she says, you know, flip back a couple pages. Jesus, this was before the cross, before the Last Supper, that Jesus says, I got to go to Jerusalem. And the disciples are going, time out, they're going to kill you there. And he says, I got to go. And so he starts going. And it's Thomas who says, let us go and die with him. He was fully persuaded that Jesus was the creator, the sustainer, the redeemer, the consummator of the universe, the Messiah promised in the Old Testament. He was fully persuaded. Now, are, are there times that our faith is challenged? And the answer is yes. But it's those times, if, if I have a doubt about, you know, my faith, that I have a doubt about what the scripture said, what I do is I rely on the things that I'm not doubting mm -hmm. to carry me through the times when there's doubt about something. I guess a lot of Chinese are Thomas. <laughs> yeah. yeah, well, me too, Jay. Let's be honest with our friends that are watching us. Okay, let let us just take it off. Let's be real honest. Our our flesh and blood is like their flesh and blood, and our hearts like their heart, and our minds are like their mind. And there are times that I'm saying, okay, this doesn't seem right, and that's why being persuaded has to do about worshiping God with our whole mind. God gave me all kinds of good feelings, and I like, I like that. Even sometimes I smell smoke, and I get the feeling maybe something's on fire, you know? I'm glad I had the warning. I rejoice in that, <laughs> you see? So feelings are given to us by God for a purpose. Feelings were not given to us by God for the basis of making decisions, <laughs> That's where many Christians get, they get messed up, they get wrapped around the axle. You know, it felt like that, that's what God wanted me to do, and it didn't work out. Where's God? Well, you know, uh, you've heard me say this before, stupid for Jesus is still stupid. It's a matter of, you know, you're using a faculty that God has given you, your feelings, and you're applying it to a situation that he didn't give you your feelings for that. He gave you, you know, your mind to think things through. It's like difference between using a hammer and a screwdriver. They're both tools, but they both do different things. And you don't use your screwdriver to put a nail in there because that's not the right use of the screwdriver. You're supposed to use the hammer. And we should be using our mind when it's appropriate. And we should be experiencing our feelings when it's yeah. appropriate. After so many conversations and discussions, I can tell you had a very powerful encountering experience with God through scripture and a lot of reasoning and all reflections. My right. question is that, do you have some memorable experience and story that 
with your prayer, you see the result. Absolutely. You know, uh, back in 2000, when actually 2001, just shortly after you and I met, uh -huh. uh, we had a situation where my daughter was in intensive care and uh, she had Guillain-Barre uh, syndrome and um, she had a high probability of dying. And I flew in from Chicago to UNM, met the doctor at the emergency room and and he tells me, Mr. Redmond, you know, uh, prepare your family, your, your wife and your son, because uh, your daughter is probably going to die today. <laughs> That's not anything any dad wants to hear. And I prayed and prayed and prayed. Others joined me in prayer and God answered. And my daughter's with us today. And I have a grandson that I, you know, I love them, love them dearly. And, but again, two more things that's tied to that, Jane. So number one is that, you know, I feel like the one that's more blessed because I didn't see the resurrection, but because of the way he made my mind and reality, I'm fully persuaded it happened. Right. Yeah. You understand? So the, the second, the second one, Jane, is I go back to Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Okay. There they are, they're in Babylon and they're being faithful to God. They get arrested because they're not eating the right food and the king's ready to throw them into the fire. And he says, our God can rescue us. But even if he doesn't, <laughs> we will not recant. Right. Here's the thing. I look at the stars. God made those. They're so impressive. Okay. I go to the Grand Canyon. I look in the Grand Canyon and it's so beautiful. And that's part of God's physical creation. And when I see creativity, whether it be in music or art or a skyscraper or an airplane that you and I fly, whenever I see creativity, I, it didn't happen. People did that. Persons had thoughts and things came into being. It, you and I look at the rest of the God's creation. I, I don't have to wonder if I say, well, God doesn't exist. I would have to explain that whoever made the Statue of Liberty, they didn't exist either. <laughs> <laughs> you see, and the and the other thing just drives me nuts is that people say if God were real, there wouldn't be evil. You know, my question is because God's real, there's goodness. Big question is why is there evil? The big question is why is there any good? <laughs> yeah. So when I talk to my athe atheist friends, which by the way, every human being is made for the purpose of worshiping God. Every human being is going to worship something, either God or something that we made or ourself. So there's no such thing as atheism, meaning there is no God. What happens is that the love and allegiance that belongs to God, that love and allegiance gets transferred to something else or somebody else. And it's usually the person that's rejecting God. So the, the Bible doesn't say that a person that rejects God is an atheist. It says they're an idolater, <laughs> that, that they're worshiping something other than God. If we don't know that we are impoverished because of our sin, then we are too arrogant to think because we will think that there is no God and we don't need God. It's not that somebody wrote all these laws, like in the Ten Commandments, that when I do something wrong, the law that's written on my heart, I condemn myself. And I know that, you know, everybody I talk to, you know, at some point sooner or later, they'll say, well, I made, I had a failure in my life, you know? Well, why, why does that feeling, that reality even exist inside a human being if there is no God? When I read the scripture, I understand myself better, and I understand that, that this world as it is, as beautiful as what it is, that this is not all. There is more, and this is fully grounded in what is going to come, that this life is on a continuum, and that you know, past death, the one that made this flesh and blood right here, past death, he's planning a new body for me. I was only about seven, eight years old when I learned that my mom had breast cancer. And then when she died, when, when I was 12, um, and there's the casket that goes into the ground and I'm not going to see my mother again. I, I had to start thinking about what's really real. <laughs> Am I ever going to see my mother again? 
And so it's not that experience that solves the question. It's that experience that motivated me to ask the serious questions about life, about death, about meaning. In the culture today, and I just saw an article two weeks ago on this, that counselors on American campuses across the United States, on you know university campuses, they said years ago the students would come and they'd say, "What can I do to give my life meaning? You know, help me, counselor." And now the kids are showing up and they're saying, "Why should I be alive?" Wow, that's that's a shift. And so for me, it's not a data point. I want to know why that happened, how that happened. And part of it comes back to the concept of the cancel culture is that there are cultural gatekeepers that don't want a Christian message out there and they're shutting it down. They're censoring by omitting. They are not permitting certain ideas into the open marketplace of ideas. And because of that, more and more people are not hearing the claim that there is an eternal God and you matter in his plan, okay? They're not hearing that. You know, the scripture would be those people that I knew that lived out the scripture. And then, you know, early in my life, you know, I had to grapple with, um, is there really something after that? So all that comes together in the person of Jesus, okay? It's not a bunch of rules, though the rules are important. It's not about, you know, all our religious gatherings and singing the songs and all. I mean, as as much as important as that is, it's about the person of Jesus. And because of who he is and because he holds the words of eternal life and answers all the questions and explains all that I see, And then when I get to the point that there's something that is not explainable, I'm trusting that the person that held the day by day by day by day by day together, I get to a new day, he's got control of the new one as well because of the past entire experience. So by conclusion and wrapping up, I guess today's uh, conversation in regards to fully persuaded that can I say if we ask uh, serious questions by whatever experiences God encountered us, God revealed you know his truth to us and we had shocking you know kind of a revelation and uh, wrestling with different thinkings and and also reflections and then if we fully persuaded in the conclusion, God is true, he's with me. If we day by day, we live that kind of a life out, we are not to be canceled by anyone because we right. have the power of God's word. And two, we probably were not separating rational thinking from biblical truth. That's right. Well, and again, as Francis Schaeffer would say, biblical truth, he would say, all truth is God's truth. And and when we break it down between biblical truth is upper story, that's your feelings. And then the lower story is where we do math and science and medicine. The the universe is connected. It's not fragmented, you know, because there's one God that spoke it into being. And, and, the universe depends upon God. God does not depend right. upon the universe. So in terms of biblical worldview, that if you are grounded with a biblical worldview, you know, sometimes I could understand why people read the Bible, a pastor don't have a biblical worldview. You know, it can be by rejection. It can be by not a passing down the total truth. But if, if we are fully persuaded, we are powerfully encountering God through scripture and the Holy Spirit and the Christian bodily living out, we should not be canceled by any culture. 
That's right. We should not separate our rational thinking with total truth. It is. And, and see, as we look in American culture, and I'm sure that the same thing is happening, you and I have seen it in, in Chinese culture as well, and just culture across the world, is that the concept and the word say entertainment, okay? The tain part, T-A-I-N, it means to hold, like retain, sustain. It means to hold it in some way. So the word entertainment means that something is coming in and holding you. And, and I think one of the reasons that the entertainment industry is so huge is that people are empty on the inside and they want something to come into them and to hold their attention because they seek me, you know, they, they feel that that's where the meaning is. But, you know, the, the entertainment, whether it's a movie, whether it's a video game, whether it's a uh, uh, immoral sexual encounter, whether it's a drug, alcohol, or whatever, you bring all these things in and they hold you. But when they wear off, what is there? Nothing. <laughs> You're still empty on the inside. And it's only Jesus, only Jesus, you know, when the Holy Spirit, when we receive the gift of the Holy Spirit, that the Holy Spirit is dwelling in us and holding us and with us every day so that that we can see the creation and everything around me from the perspective of God. And so, you know, people get discouraged, they get disappointed, disappointed they get despaired, get depressed, and all, all, all of those in some way lead back to who am I? Why do I exist? Does life have any meaning? What happens after death? Those are all the worldview questions and people who are serious and sit down and they, they use the mind that God gave them and think it through to the point of being fully persuaded, the probability of them being rocked by a, a life-changing experience like the death of a child. We had a lengthy and full discussion and i'm very pleased to dig into deeper you know some of the uh thinkings and issues and uh, really appreciate 